Okay, hello. So you catch us a very interesting moment um, of our work to give a lecture about standards and um, because what you see here is uh, the cover of our upcoming book we are working on now for uh, unbelievable six months. Um, and this book somehow uh, points out to a, um, a changing moment in, uh, in our work because the last year, so since um, the office moved from Cologne to Berlin in uh, 2006, there has been um, a row of uh, classical architecture designs, but during mainly the last two years, a lot of uh, involvement in um, discussing the city, uh, pointing out to some problems, uh, mainly in Berlin, which um, um, comes mainly with the fact that uh, Berlin was preparing for an international building exhibition, like the one that's running in Hamburg right now, for the year 2020, which is um, now a project uh, which has come for a couple of weeks ago. And um, all this, all this little finger uh, points that we were doing uh, mainly in the last two years um, led to the fact that we somehow came into the role of, um, 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 t t t let's say, kind of a leading voice in, in the Berlin architecture discussion, which we cannot be in a way because we are not someone who does research on architecture actually, we are still architects. But, um, at the beginning of 2012, we were somehow confronted with the situation that we were asked to do an exhibition in uh, the, the art field about what we are talking about all the time. And um, the reason why it's so interesting to talk about our work at that moment is that this book somehow changes uh, our complete view on all these discussions that were going on the last years and also on our work. Because in the beginning the idea was that, so that we give away our archives somehow and someone else is um, doing a book on our work, uh, depending on that archive, but that doesn't work out in the end. So uh, the beginning was quite easy. We had uh, Nicolas Kuhnert and Anne Lynn Go, both editors of Ach Plus, that somehow tried to um, give a theoret theoretical um, uh, text to, to uh, all the things that we have been talking about but um, then we uh, started to work with um, someone uh, who has been a lecturer and editor for books for quite a while and does it in a very um, yeah let's say old-fashioned way which is nothing uh, negative in that way but every word we were uh, writing and saying in the last years somehow suddenly was asked so we are confronted in, mainly in the last weeks with questions like why did you say it like this, why did you say it like that, what does that mean for your work, what does that mean for um, the discussions you are participating. So you will probably recognize uh, in, in, in this lecture that we are somehow confused a bit with our own work and all the topics we are um, involved in. Um, you will also recognize that it's mainly about Berlin because that was our topic um, for the main time. That doesn't mean that we are only working uh, uh, in Berlin, but um, of course the focus is on that. And um, there's only one project from uh, outside of Berlin. And um, so maybe we, we get into the, uh, the lecture. Like uh, one thing that was already mentioned um, is. Um, the, the topic of aesthetics and they are very important for contemporary Berlin because somehow they are part of the, uh, the big attraction that the city gives uh, to let maybe uh, entire Europe or the entire world at the moment because immigration is um, a word that has a complete different meaning in a city like uh, Berlin. Uh, of course you have uh, some um, processes that are uh, comparable with uh, what the word immigration uh, regularly means but uh, what mainly happens is that a lot of people move to Berlin and are immigrants um, of let's say kind of creative industry in a way because probably you know that Berlin hasn't any big companies or 
only a few and um, there are no no uh, big factories and stuff like this. There's mainly a big um, uh, creative scene. And um, this, let's call them maybe creative or, or lifestyle immigrants somehow uh, caused a new uh, process of immigration. The, the immigration in between the city. Like that means there are certain spots in Berlin where these people go to, like Goldsberg for example, or um, the very middle of Berlin, Berlin Mitte, which causes waves of people who lived there before that have to migrate in between the city to the outskirts of the city too. Like um, probably Berlin Spandau is one of these uh, spots in the city, but also the uh, large scale housing projects of the former GERs, like uh, town parts like Marzahn, for example, Hellersdorf, uh, and also the Märkisches Viertel. <coughs> um, this aesthetics I've been talking about are, this, uh, uh, are the result uh, probably of um, uh, 50 or 60 years of uh, uh, not so well running economy in both parts of the town. So in the eastern part, as well as in the western part. Um, and after the reunification, I think um, most of the Germans didn't know so uh, exact what to do with this new capital uh, that was there suddenly. So there was a first wave of uh, investing in Berlin, which um, somehow went wrong. Uh, we're probably going to talk about that later. Um, but um, the first um, signs of uh, that, that creative uh, migration um, were a lot or tons of, of, of young Germans from both parts of the uh, of the country that somehow um, occupied Berlin as a as a giant space uh, and and developed their very own strategies and tools. Like this, for example, is um, the uh, Tresor, a famous uh, techno club in Berlin, which is not, uh, not existing anymore. But I'm going to show you some pictures to, to give you an idea of uh, uh, what I mean when I talk about Berlin aesthetics. It simply means that you, you occupy space that's already there, and you don't uh, have that much amount of money to, to change the space, so you work with what's there, and it's uh, very... Uh, um, low and um, but somehow out of this uh, kind of working with the space you, you develop a very honest aesthetic like here for example in another club the dirt and probably this picture um, could be I mean in that case it's a, it's a techno club but if you go for, uh, to, to Goldsberg for example almost uh, every second flat will look like this I think uh, one thing that, that everyone, uh, a lot of people do when they when they rent a new flat in a, in a uh, 19th century uh, building is that they take away the uh, wallpapers as far as possible and they leave the, um, um, the rest which could not be uh, easily uh, be done away so um, also the, the, the ceilings are very uh, low treated um, which is probably a strategy that uh, uh, a lot of people know from their student time, uh, 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 not a very specific Berlin, but what's specific is uh, that uh, new built buildings or um, restaurants, bars, uh, uh, etc. work with uh, exactly this uh, aesthetic and they have um, like they invest a lot of money and a lot of work and time to make the place actually look like uh, it's old and it's uh, part of that typical Berlin aesthetic. Like I already figured out, mainly this um, this phenomenon in Berlin is um, uh, comes with the with the buildings that are from the uh, industrial uh, revolution times in Berlin, which uh, we still have a lot of. Um, buildings uh, through the, the Second World War. Um, this one is a flat uh, of a uh, friend of ours, uh, Christopher Roth, uh, a filmmaker, and he kind of um, tried to switch that idea a little bit, because um, like you can see out of his window, he, he didn't move to Goldsberg, he uh, moved to Lichtenberg, 
um, a part of Berlin which is uh, quite close to the inner city, but um, not yet um, on, on the map of um, uh, other people that are coming from outside uh, of Berlin to Berlin because its uh, reputation is quite bad. Like the typical cliche of uh, Lichtenberg would be, uh, be careful, uh, a Nazi will beat you up there as soon as you enter the part of the town, which is uh, not true, but um, um, yeah, still in the heads of the most people. So um, I would say Lichtenberg might probably have, uh, which is uh, very interesting at these days in Berlin, like 90% of original Berliners there. Um, this is a project that um, we are not working on, actually. It will be uh, um, a topic, I think, in uh, the next one, uh, two, or maybe three years. Um, this is um, VEB Elektrokohle. VEB means um, um, state-owned company, which was uh, quite um, usual in the GDR because it was a socialist country so um, this building gets um, gets closed and, and mainly teared down and occupied by the uh, Vietnamese uh, community so they have a, a huge shopping center there which mainly consists of um, Vietnamese articles um, you can have, uh, have Vietnamese food there and it's more or less like the, the, the city center for the quite big Vietnamese uh, community in Berlin which uh, still comes from the GDR times. Um, after uh, uh, closing the factory um, the only leftovers are these two concrete towers that the factory was built around. Um, there is uh, not that much inside than the staircase and uh, some slabs, as in not all the windows you see have, have uh, slabs underneath. So um, no one wanted to buy um, these this two leftovers of the factory because, um, like I told you, the, the area is quite not that good reputed and uh, there are also some, some difficulties with the master planning of uh, the Berlin um, um, urban development uh, planners. Um, but we try to uh, somehow uh, uh, develop any concept for the two towers, which uh, I don't want to go that far into. Um, but what's quite interesting talking about uh, aesthetics is that at the beginning when we came up with uh, images of the building, no one wanted to go outside to that place. Um, everyone said, what do you want with these two concrete uh, horror things? Um, but um, talking on, on a level of, of image, when we introduced the image of San Gimignano, which is a completely different thing, people started to like uh, add these two images and get more involved and became like uh, thinking about the thing, which I think is quite interesting um, on, on that level of images. So that's a view outside of one of the towers to the surroundings. Um, <clears throat> Down there is um, the Don Juan Center, the, the Vietnamese market. So, some, some words more about uh, Berlin. Like, Berlin has, for example, this, this very uh, interesting uh, um, tradition of squatting, and uh, not even only in, in West Berlin, as one might think, even in, Est, in, in the eastern part of town, you had uh, something which was uh, probably be able to be uh, called a squatter movement, mainly in the area of Prenzlauer Berg, which is um, today known for completely uh, different things. Um, I think some of you might know that um, this, this whole um, squatting movement in West Berlin, for example, had an, a huge impact on uh, the international uh, building exhibition that um, was done in Berlin in the 80s. So that um, the, the whole concept of this building exhibition was split into a IBA alt, which means IBA old, um, a part that deals with, with the old and existing structures, mainly in, um, in Kreuzberg, and uh, the IBA neu, which uh, brought us um, all these um, famous uh, buildings. 
But uh, here, for example, you can see a photography which was taken um, in, at the Institute of uh, Architecture Theory of the HFK Hochschule uh, um, der Künste, um, meanwhile Odeka. Um, and that was the institute that was run by Jonas Geist at that time. And um, it's somehow a, a, a reference to, to this, um, what we call the typical Berlin um, strategy. It's like, if you take a look at this, you have um, a, a simple switch, uh, a one and two. And another thing that's uh, quite a big impact on Berlin is, of course, the large scale housing. It not only like uh, Märkisches Viertel in the western part, or uh, Marzahn and, and, and all the, the GDR leftovers. Uh, I think today where, where they are not so well reputated, one has to think of, of the, um, the basic idea that these housing projects were um, um, based on. Like, um, I think we, we don't have to talk about Stalin Ali or Karl Marx Ali, uh, how it's called today, where um, the idea was like comparing to what we heard before to give palaces to the workers or uh, to the people. We also have the world heritage of um, the um, a modernist Berlin uh, settlements and uh, names like Taut. And um, so there's a huge tradition of. of, of social housing in Berlin somehow that um, also probably uh, uh, in, in the state of an, of, an, of an leftover image. Because the reality in Berlin in 2013 is uh, more like this, like advertisements for luxury housing, <clears throat> mainly uh, on, on uh, the very best spots that are uh, left over in Berlin and uh, unfortunately a lot of times on um, sites that were originally owned by the community which means that um, the government of Berlin sells sites mainly in, in, in the, the very center of the city for very low prices and uh, what comes on that site are projects like these, or these for example. So they, they don't even deal any longer with, um, with this uh, aesthetics I was talking uh, about in the beginning. They bring um, a kind of uh, imaginations that come from somewhere else. And um, what's very important is that they talk about historical, Mitte, historical uh, uh, city center, which is one of the probably um, the biggest and uh, uh, most concerning things going on in Berlin right now. <coughs> um, so we, we were kind of, um, with the first experiences that the office made from 2006 on in Berlin, uh, we were kind of, uh, of aware of a lot of this topic. It's like um, um, the, the rehistorization of the, of the city, um, the rent problem, um, the gentrification thing, and uh, the way it's read, and of course um, the the kind of position that you take in the middle of all these processes when you work there as an architect, where you are always connected to like uh, the the economy, uh, economical wealthy uh, side. Um, we started to collect newspapers with articles on, on uh, the urban planning and um, everything we, we could get and this was later published as part of uh, the exhibition that we were doing last year. Like for example, just to give you a clue, um, the, the left article says uh, that the, the, the part of town called Kreuzberg is meanwhile more expensive than the former uh, center of West Berlin. Um, this is the, the, the senator for uh, urban development in Berlin and he is very clear saying that the rent is of course going to be higher and higher. Um, also a topic which is quite clear now is that um, the, the, the poorer part of uh, the, the city inhabitants has to move to the outskirts. Why you have like, and this is a 
probably a, a quite cynical uh, thing, uh, a, a very, very expensive uh, luxury living um, next to uh, next to Bertolt Brecht's uh, Theater on uh, the Schiffbau Dam. So one of the projects that we, we that we we did in the beginning was, um, I mean, like like I, I mentioned, we are architects, so we are uh, um, we go to the office every day and we do architecture work. We think how to 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 run a building, how is the construction side running. Uh, we are not researchers in a way. We try to, but um, let's say there are people who um, who are professional researchers in a way and uh, who, who deliver um, a pure information. But we wanted to get kind of into a discussion with other architects, with town planners, with the the, the authorities, uh, with the people who are actually um, aware of the problems which are going on. And it's a lot of them in Berlin, like initiatives and, uh, and stuff. And, a lot of them without uh, the, the driving force of architects. And um, this project uh, to shortcut, for example, was during the elections in 2011, uh, elections for the, the, the Berlin um, uh, government. And um, we teamed up with some um, other architects, uh, or mainly in this, uh, in this case, um, uh, institutions, and um, developed this. Um, um, election poster, which consists uh, of the uh, of the color code of all the parties that uh, were running in the election, and we asked people to uh, put that poster every time uh, over existing posters when um, there are uh, quotes from the parties which say uh, actually nothing uh, about the, the urban planning thing. Um, the time we we uh, we did readings of the of the party programs and it was um, tremendous shocking how the parties uh, uh, treat the, the topic of uh, urban planning. Um, another project that we did and um, sadly I don't have more pictures of that with me today because um, it's actually based on a on a Chinese uh, um, a cultural strategy the the. Um, strategy of Shanzai. Um, the, the German television was asking us to do uh, something about um, the Stadtschloss in Berlin. And probably you know that um, um, in the, right in the middle of Berlin at the moment, and for, for, I think for Germans that's a quite boring topic, um, the castle where the emperor used to live and which was destroyed in 1951, I think, uh, is going to be rebuilt with um, us, the German community, having no idea what to do with the castle, actually. Uh, there are ideas, but I think they are rather shortcuts. So um, the, the German television came up and said, okay, can we do something um, which, which gives um, that uh, topic uh, um, Maybe some some fresh juice and, and bring it back to the to the German um, uh, uh, public, and so we suggested that where uh, Chinese investors, for example, um, uh, in in Iceland, like four or five years ago, when when the country of Iceland got bankrupt, they uh, they took over the construction side. Of think of the Icelandic Opera, I'm not sure, but a very big project and um, um, invested and finished that project and um, similar things are happening in small scale in Greece, for example, now. So we um, we came up with the idea that um, the, the Stadtschloss is going to be a ruin in 2021 and uh, a Chinese uh, investor will come up to Berlin and solve the problem with kind of Shanzai by putting the original um, suggest suggestion of uh, um, Sir Norman Foster for the Reichstag over the ruin of um, the Stadtschloss. Another project that we did at that time was uh, called um, The Double Berlin, which um, simply dealt with um, the the fact that um, the, 
the time of West and East Berlin is of course um, a very um, important topic for, for Berlin because it's sold to the tourists and you can take a picture with um, the Red Army guy and with the US Army guy on, on Checkpoint Charlie but actually town planning uh, is um, trying to to uh, forget about the time of East and West Germany which means on the one hand like that you still have to work with master plans there that are made uh, by, for example by uh, Hans Kohlhoff um, for the Alexanderplatz and um, have like one one main aim uh, which is uh, to, to, to push away the Eastern modernism and uh, on the other hand, uh, Western modernism in Berlin, like the city center um, around the Gedächtniskirche, are also in a, in a quite critical uh, situation now, where we think that by all the, all the things that happened in Berlin during that time, like this, um, it was kind of a small cold war with architecture, like the, the, the United States gave a Congress hall to the western part of Berlin, so it's uh, in between three years um, East Berlin had its uh, Congress Hall and this was going on and on, um, like uh, uh, arming in, in, in the Cold War deal. Like we, we think that um, the, this as, a, as, a, as one layer of Berlin is um, pretty underrepresented uh, and should be like probably the starting point for developing a new city model for that city, which is now working uh, from day to day. <clears throat> so, talking about a new city model, uh, when we were asked to do an exhibition, uh, we didn't exactly know what to show them, because the main thing that we uh, were doing was uh, being concerned and, and uh, um, doing some provocation with small projects, but um, we also didn't come up with, like, we have the city model for Berlin, and how could we as, as a small architecture office? So we suggested to um, base the exhibition, um, or let's not say exhibition, like more um, the, the, the kind of forum that we were uh, able to use to, to probably go deeper in, in, into this course. We suggested to base um, that project on um, the Stadt in the Stadt, in the Stadt, the city within the city, um, a um, work that was done by Oswald Matthias Ungers, Hans Kohlhoff, uh, Arthur Owaska, and uh, Rim Kohlhaas at the end of the 70s as a summer school for the Cor uh, Cornell University in Berlin. Um, and the quite interesting thing with um, um, Die Stadt in der Stadt is uh, that, that it's a, a quite famous uh, urban planning pamphlet, I think, um, mainly through the um, uh, drawings which are well known and uh, are somehow always uh, connected to uh, Oswald Matthias Ungers. But uh, actually we, we weren't able to find anyone in Berlin uh, um, that could really tell us what's in that work. And um, like you see, we have a, a handmade copy of the, um, of the original script and um, it's, it's quite short uh, and you couldn't get anything else than uh, this, this hand copy script. Meanwhile, I think like a month ago, uh, Florian Hertwig um, um, published um, a book uh, on, on the Green Archipelago, as it's also co uh, called. And um, part of this book is um, the original pamphlet that was written by Ryan Kohlhaas for the Green Archipelago, which makes uh, a lot of things uh, quite clearer because the um, um, Green Archipelago is based on, on, um, on architectural answers like uh, the city villa, which is quite um, um, different to understand uh, on the first hand. But, um, to, to get back to, to the red line, uh, our idea was that this was the last time someone really tried to, uh, um, to develop a visionary uh, uh, urban planning uh, model for, for Berlin and then it was only West Berlin and then it was at that moment um, 
a shrinking city, which is not uh, yet. Um, so what I'm going to show you now is um, um, uh, a photo essay which was done by Erika Overmeer, um, a Dutch photographer who uh, also did uh, the German Pavilion in, in Venice last year. And um, she came into the project after, yeah, I think, half time when already like um, um, new new claiming words were there like heterogeneity and uh, the grain of the city. And um, at that point, it became confusing for us, like I mentioned before, because we gave away our work and some uh, someone tried to to to. Uh, or someone came up asking us, and um, she went out and uh, tried to to uh, document our our project. So I'm not going to say too much about this because we're going to see that later also. That's again the double Berlin, Leipziger Straße next to the Springer building. Conversion of uh, Werner Dubmann's uh, Church St. Agnes. <coughs> the office. The exhibition. So now we are on the point that, like I mentioned, we, we have been asked all these questions about the questions we've been asking before and the main question is how, uh, how does that affect your architecture and um, I think for us at the moment we, we deal with that question in a way, okay, we, we, we give you all the information for that book, um, you can ask us questions we think about but um, uh, in the end, uh, it has to speak for itself. So um, now I'm going to show you some projects, and probably we have later the chance in, in the panel to to uh, talk about them. Like this is the project I've been talking before. Uh, one project which is not in Berlin, although um, the, the the structure is uh, quite reminding onto Berlin. But this is Copenhagen, and um, the task for this project was um, that um, it's a, a a poorer part of Copenhagen and um, the city government got kind of concerned when um, graffitis appeared uh, in that area. Um, for, for, compared to most of the cities I wouldn't say that's a, a problem part of town but they were kind of uh, fearing that it could become one. So they had the idea of introducing a project which brings what they called low culture which meant sports and especially football and high culture, which means in that case uh, chess and dancing. Um, and um, the rules were quite simple. So there should be a space for, for football uh, games, which had a certain height, and uh, a space for all other activities. So what we took was, um, of course, the, the typical basketball field with uh, with its height. It was the first parameter, uh, and we uh, pushed it as far outside as uh, the side allowed us to. And then we connected that with uh, the existing structure, which uh, made the rest of the space. Um, important in that case was that we uh, didn't introduce. Um, like um, the, the, the standard of uh, uh, normal uh, insulated building, um, we, at the very um, uh, 
point at the beginning we made clear that we see this only as a climate um, uh, shelf around uh, the activity of sports because if, um, for, for like playing soccer or volleyball or handball you don't need much more than 16 degrees in, in a hall, you don't need to heat it up to like 24, 25 and um, you could also probably at some month of the year uh, keep your jacket uh, on in the other spaces so we, we saved money to like provide more space in this case so here's some, some pictures of the models to give you probably a short idea of, of um, how um, this was developed So you have the sports field, you have uh, the cabins, and you have like space for cafeteria and um, other activities there. Um, this is the project we are working on uh, at the moment. It's uh, uh, maybe a bit provocative name is Antibola, which comes from the fact that um, it's at the outskirts of Berlin, uh, very near to, to Potsdam, and um, in this area you have a lot of lakes, and comparable to what happened, for example, in Munich in, in the 70s and 80s, when, when the city is full, uh, people start to look for their uh, weekend uh, and vacation homes, so all the, the, the sites around the that lakes are gone, and um, there's actually no chance to, to, to get something there anymore. But these uh, both buildings are also leftovers from the GR time. This was also a state-owned uh, factory, a knitting factory. Um, and it was um, offered uh, very cheap and no one wanted it because of the leftover buildings. Um, the, the authorities said, okay, if you, um, um, you have to pay for, for, for tearing down these two buildings and afterwards you're allowed to build three houses on the same side, uh, which no one uh, is allowed to be uh, larger than 90 square meters. But um, as you can probably uh, figure out, both of these buildings are more than 90 square meters. So um, we, we um, self-financed um, this site uh, and uh, bought it and decided not to tear down these two buildings and keep uh, all the square meters that are already there. So, um, functionally it's planned to have uh, like um, rooms for um, uh, the study program there and a summer office and uh, um, lots of other working space. But we've been planning with that for, for quite a while, like almost three years now. Um, the, the strategy was if we keep it, then uh, we keep as much as possible and we try to, to make it work, uh, work for, for, for our ideas. Um, the problem was with the roof, for example, that um, the roof was uh, contaminated and um, also quite weak, so um, it had to be uh, taken away, like you see here. And um, we decided to, to exchange it with a, with a concrete roof. And with the concrete roof came the concrete core, which is, uh, this is actually a picture from two days ago. Um, the idea was to have a new roof, like you see it here, with um, the, the added uh, concrete core. And this should be the main intervention of the building. So, no extra insulation, no uh, um, extra work where it's not needed, just the roof and the core, and the core brings all um, the functions uh, that, that we need at, at this place. And in this case, it's mainly heating. So we, um, we talked to our uh, um, engineers and asked them, is it possible to heat that building only with a sauna? And they said, no, well, <laughs> not with the, with the German laws, uh, of course. So there was a long process of uh, um, of conversations with, with the engineers and a lot of uh, mathematical uh, problems until we made it somehow work in a way. So what you see here, it's the sauna which heats uh, the entire floor. 
the bathroom next to it, it of course, uh, um, there's a, a, a heat transfer in between them. And all the other things that you see here surrounding, um, these two like onion-like um, uh, structures are uh, curtains. So when it gets colder, in the summer, of course, you have like all the space. But when it gets colder and you have to stop heating, you use your sauna and uh, the heat of the sauna and close the first curtain. And the colder it gets, the more narrow the curtain around the core gets. So th that's mainly the intervention in that case. And um, I think from starting with, with next winter, we will see uh, how good the math work by the engineers really was then. The second, um, the second intervention that was done in that case was there were a lot of uh, different uh, um, kind of uh, windows in that building because um, this building was kind of a test building for um, GDR bricklayer brigades. Um, but unfortunately, the the, the main uh, sides of the building were too narrow, like um, the view to the seaside. So we decided to. Like probably if you know the film Famrock, uh, to to bring new windows uh, uh, there and just put the glass uh, um, glued behind in that case. <clears throat> um, quite interesting was when uh, we were doing a, a, a workshop with students there in last September, and uh, it was quite warm in the beginning, so um, most of them preferred to to sleep outside. But uh, when the weather changed at the middle of September and got really cold, they uh, themselves adapted the strategy of uh, the curtain uh, core around the bedroom. And um, also what they first introduced was um, um, this kind of, of bath situation. So these are the students and I'm, I'm probably going to show you um, the project that they were doing there. It was quite a, a small thing. Um, the leftovers of the so-called um, uh, culture um, barrack, so the place where like concerts and, and um, uh, beer evenings for the workers of the, uh, the knitting factory were done. And uh, like you see, it's in a very um, yeah, bad condition in a way. But the state of Brandenburg, comparable to, I think, uh, maybe the most of the German states has a building law which uh, says as long as you uh, have three walls standing of a building um, uh, the space is protected as an existing space so if you uh, redo that space you're allowed to keep it even if the new master plan says um, there should be less square meters like in this case we had uh, to help a little bit for uh, the authorities because like this wall was already down and, and the other two walls were quite damaged so that they normally would not say this is existing space. But in this part there were like the toilets and the bathroom, this was quite okay. And um, we decided to um, keep, keep the space um, uh, inspired by um, um, artist uh, Rachel Whitebury who did um, like the uh, this famous concrete building that you probably might know in London, but this time in another way because we wanted to keep the space, we couldn't fill the whole building with concrete. We just uh, um, um, did uh, an outside um, concrete uh, print somehow of that building. So this was all planned and done by um, 15 students on site in three weeks. Like you see, as left over, you have the, the print of the, the former door in, in the concrete structure. Um, the, the main windows of, of the old toilet building uh, uh, are kept, other buildings, uh, other windows are kept in, in the concrete structure. And um, we didn't exactly know what happened in that part, but it's quite nice, I think. So, in a quick um, uh, run through, I probably introduced the building that, that uh, somehow brought us into the position of uh, uh, talking about all this stuff. 
where we haven't built that much in the last time. Um, it's uh, the building where our office is uh, situated in uh, Berlin Mitte, Brunnenstraße. And uh, it's also a quite typical Berlin situation. It's an uh, investment ruin from the 90s. Like you have already a basement done, you have um, the, the plates over the basement on one side, on the other side it's not done, but you have the core for the elevator. And uh, you have uh, someone who sells you the site who has uh, parameters that are already in the contract, like give me light for my lowest window. Then other parameters come like fire escape letters who are only 8 meters high, so you have to triangulate the courtyard. And then uh, there are of course parameters that you bring yourself, like the outside staircase, because you want to keep um, the space as free as possible. So the, the building or, or the curvature of the building was already done by these parameters, like the roof shaped by the sun and in the staircase and the triangulated courtyard. So you go on to this existing structure from the 90s and then as a reference to, to the strict imaginations of uh, Berlin town planners you put a reference on uh, being part of your uh, neighborhood by taking exactly the heights that they bring but use this as a, a thick beam that allows you to put your outside staircase and then you have just slabs, like uh, Bell was probably talking about before. And um, like this uh, drawing is pointing out, we have uh, we have no no extra insulations. We have no uh, skin work done in the building. It's just the concrete with only little um, interventions on. And uh, you see probably the situation that we have right now on that floor with the office. But of course it could be uh, very different easily in a short time. So the square meter of this building was 1080 euros. So this uh, both pictures show um, the, the street level um, to the street. Like the, in this case, it's, it's a topic of uh, accessibility. We have an art gallery, actually, who are in there, which still keeps a kind of a border, but they have a, 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 a huge door which they could open during the summertime. And on this picture, you could probably see how we handle um, all the infrastructural things um, um, that the building brings with it, like the heating is just on, on the concrete and yeah, you see the, the heating box and stuff like this, so it's just the concrete and um, the facade. The outside staircase. View into the building. And the building in use. <coughs> so, one project before I come to the end, which is not by our office, but um, probably quite interesting where we're talking about standards. Um, this is a building that, uh, or will be a building on the next building, a picture that uh, Christian von Boris, uh, um, a Berlin filmmaker, um, did like three years ago for himself. Um, he was just reading an article in, in uh, the newspaper about La Catrova Saal and was uh, quite uh, um, impressed by uh, what they did with the social housing project in Mohaus. And he was living in, in Kreuzberg at that time and had, had to move out um, of his flat um, because uh, of one of the, the luxury projects that um, came there. In this case, a very interesting thing called Karloff, where you can go with your car into the flat on the, on the eighth floor, but that probably leads us too far. So he got 40,000 euros to move out of his flat the next day, more or less. And um, with 40,000 euros at that time, three years ago, you were not even part, uh, in, in the position to buy like 20 square meters any longer. So he, he thought about how to, or he and, and Werhard Holman, um, his, his girlfriend, thought about how to, to uh, uh, 
with 40,000 years uh, create living space uh, in Berlin. And they found this roof in, in I don't know, factory in Wedding, where they just put one of this meanwhile quite famous um, uh, La Catrovasal uh, um, greenhouses on. So the concept is quite easy. They have like two uh, um, cores in the building. That one is uh, the kitchen and uh, sleeping core. And on the other side, they have a bathroom core, which uh, also uh, carries the oven. And the rest of the space, the space in between the two cores and the space on the two cores is the additional space that you could use when it's warm enough outside. Um, but you have to deal with the fact that you're living in a greenhouse. So, so uh, I want to come to the end um, with the with, uh, last uh, um, thing I point to, to our work. Like Arc Plus was um, probably the ones that brought us a bit more deeper into thinking about the typologies of things that we are doing. This is a very old project by the office in Cologne called the Kernel Brett, which also deals somehow with uh, this aesthetic question because um, the, um, the guy who asked the office to do that building asked for lofts, for new lofts, but as lofts new, which is quite interesting because lofts are most of the time. Um, living from the fact that they are not in a new building. Um, but with, with this downgrading of standards, which doesn't mean that we really want to have uh, uh, less standards in, 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 in the buildings that we, that we live and work, uh, and to talk more about the insulation standards or the standards that we are asked to uh, do for someone, um, we, we started to develop uh, a new or type uh, typology we call the vier Richtungsmodule, which means uh, um, modules uh, um, dealing with uh, the four directions um, uh, west, uh, north, east, and south. Uh, and it comes simply from the idea that the, the, um, uh, the best um, direction for uh, living is um, east west, and the best direction for uh, working is uh, north south. So, for also for the International uh, Building Exhibition in Hamburg, we um, created um, this uh, um, hybrid house, which was uh, in the end not built by our office, but by another office, which is also quite an interesting thing, because we didn't get along with our investor when we said we would deal with the insulation thing in a different way. And he said, okay, we don't want to do some experiment. We, we do normal insulation and that's it. And um, after, uh, uh, after a couple of weeks um, talking about uh, um, the project in that way with the investor, we, we had to cancel it and then they took over the, the design and built it in a, a very, or in a quite, um, quite uh, normal way, which uh, brought no extras uh, as we thought of them. But um, this, this typology, which came out of an, of an old uh, project in Cologne, um, developed during the time, like you see on the left side, the Hamburg project, and on the right side, the first try um, um, to, to realize it. This, unfortunately, not in Germany, it's in, in Uruguay. But um, the idea is quite simple, like you have the two tubes, the, the one is the working tube, the other one is the living tube, and at the cross point, of course, you have uh, your staircase and the connection of uh, the two functions. And um, this is probably the last stage that we reached with that so far. We, we tried to, to bring it in um, a position where you could also fill in, in uh, inner city situations and could, uh, of, of course, like build um, a longer uh, structures than the ones that are quite limited with, uh, with the 90 degrees in the X type. Okay, so I think we stop at that point. Thank you.